Amen, 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 amen. Good morning. Well, if you have your Bible or if you have a way to access your Bible, today we're going to be in the book of Proverbs in the 29th chapter, and we're going to read one of the most familiar verses in the entire Bible. It's, uh, it's 2020. It's a new year. It's a new decade, some folks say. And uh, in fact, some of you, I haven't even seen you since, since last year. It's been a while. Uh, ha, ha, ha. But the, you know, the, the words 2020, the number 2020 is so significant because it just sort of reminds us of you know, what we know to be ideal vision. And so as we begin this new year, wouldn't it be appropriate for us to start by thinking about what it would look like in our lives, in our church, to have that kind of vision that we would want to get from God, 2020 vision. And so let's uh, read this, uh, this really famous verse. People, uh, before I read it though, I just make the comment that a lot of times people will ask me, what Bible translation do I preach from? And the answer is, is I don't preach from a Bible translation. I preach from the original language, from Hebrew or Greek, but I read typically the New International Version. I just have for many years, and like a lot of people, I just do it because I've always done it. There's not any particular reason. But every once in a while, I'll be reading from it and preaching up here and sharing it with you and go, you know, I don't like the translation. And this morning is an example of that. So I want to show you Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. We'll start with the, the reading in the NIV. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Now, I don't, I don't dislike that translation. It just doesn't, doesn't speak to me as clearly as the old King James, or what we call the authorized version of the Bible. <laughs> Thank you. Which says... Where there's no vision, the people perish. Everybody knows that. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, I don't super love that translation either. In fact, I, I've always sort of preferred the way Eugene Peterson tries to flesh out what the Proverbs trying to say here in his very famous translation called The Message. It, it reads like this. If people can't see what God is doing... They stumble all over themselves, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. Now, all these translations, what they actually show us is, is, is something kind of interesting here, and that is that it's not easy to figure out what the proverb is trying to tell us. The, the translations are different because the Hebrew language here, which it was written in, has different possible translations. And particularly this word vision in Hebrew is the word hatzon. So, you know, it's, it's the new year. It's time to learn a new word. Uh, why don't we all try to say that Hebrew word together, hatzon? Oh, man, you, you guys sound like you've known Hebrew for years. Hatzon, I mean, it just sounds like Hebrew. You kind of spit a little bit when you, you know, when you say it. Hatzon is a Hebrew word that is used in the Bible for the moment when God gives a vision to a prophet. And so God will give a vision to a prophet. The prophet who gets the vision has been given the vision for a reason. And that reason is to share that message with the people. And so a hot zone, a vision, it's not just the message that's kind of downloaded from heaven. It is also the message that is then expounded for everyone to hear. But the vision is not complete, the hatzon, until the people hear it and they respond. And so when the, when the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish or cast off restraint, or another translation is where they just run amok or they just anarchy, it's saying when people are not Someone is not receiving God's message, communicating God's message, and the people are not taking God's message in and putting it to practice in their life. So as we begin 2020, wouldn't it be great this year to say that's what we want to do? 
God, we want your hot zone. We want to hear what it is that you want us to know, and we want to begin to put that to work practically in our lives. And so when the Bible speaks about this vision, it's talking about what God wants us to hear, what God wants us to know, and what God wants to put in place in our life. Now this morning, if you got your notes, you want to follow along with me, I just want to share with you just a couple things about this. First of all, just to say, this is really important, you know? So let's talk about the, the importance of it. You know, when we say that vision is important, like why is it important? Why is it important as we begin 2020 for us to hear God's hasson in our life? What's the importance of it? Well, it's not really rocket science. I mean, you can see it in the passage. A couple of obvious things. First of all, this passage shows us that without it, there's no direction. Without God's vision, without God's instruction, without God's revelation, then our lives are without direction. We don't want to go through 2020 or the rest of our lives without direction, so we want this in our life. Thankfully, God's given it to us in one form in this book I'm holding in my hand called The Bible. Now, I just kind of tell you that the word Bible is an old word from the word Biblia, which actually means books, not book. Because the Bible's not just a book, it is a book of books. There's 66 of them in there, if you didn't know that. And the ancients referred to the Bible not as a book or books, Biblia, but they referred to it as a grefe or scriptures. So when the apostle speaks to the young pastor named Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 6, and he talks about the Bible, he doesn't call it the Bible, <laughs> he calls it scripture. So let's read this verse which says, all scripture, all holy scripture is God breathed. That's in Greek, theonoustos. Theo meaning God, noustos meaning breathe. All scripture is God <sighs> breathed. He's breathed into it. It's his, here's the image not just of what we would envision, but we would, his breath. And it is useful for teaching and rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, with Scripture, you have direction, you have vision, you have clarity about what you're supposed to do in your life, but without it, there's no direction. Now, the proverb also shows us something else, that without vision, there's not only not direction, but there's disaster. Peril. The word in the, in the Hebrew means someone just being out of control and the consequences are disaster. Without vision in your life, without vision in our church, without vision in our world, it's disaster. In a few minutes, you guys are going to head out of here and some of you, most of you are going to get in a car and get out on the highway. And, uh, you know, and if you're not right after the services, sometime this week you're probably going to get in a car and you're going to be driving down the road. And if you're following the speed limit, you know, you're probably going to be driving around 60, 70 miles an hour. Now, some of you, I know, it's more like 80 or 90. I see you out there. But, you know, wherever you're driving, however fast you're driving, just imagine you're driving down the road 70 miles an hour. When all of a sudden you lose all visibility. Maybe there's a little grass fire on the side of the road and the wind changes direction, blows smoke in front of you, and from then on, you can't see where you're going. You're just driving down the road. Most of us, if that were to happen to us, we would do what? We'd hit the brakes. But let's just say that you're driving, you're just driving down the road and you can't see anything suddenly and you're just like, you know, this is kind of fun. This is kind of cool. I'm not used to driving without being able to see. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep on going. Now, if you continued to drive without vision at 70 miles an hour, what's gonna happen? It's gonna be disaster. It's gonna be disastrous for you, for other people. Here's the deal: all of us in January 2020 are driving. Our lives, the most precious thing that God ever gave us, our lives, we are driving right now at the speed of life. 
And if we are driving at the speed of life with no visibility, with no vision from God, we are driving without guidance, and folks, we are heading for disaster. Vision is important. In fact, after, after Timothy was instructed about the importance of Scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16, he goes on to say this, which you know, a lot of people know the verse that says all Scripture is God-breathed, but don't continue to read maybe what happens after that. Listen to what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The apostle, and I imagine Paul almost like kind of holding up his hand, maybe holding out his other hand and saying, in the presence of God and, and, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Preach the word is what he says to him. Preach the word. Like in the presence of God, I give you this charge. Preach the word. It's like the, the message that the prophet would have gotten about the vision of God to share God's word. For the time will come when the people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their, their itching ears want to hear. They'll, they'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, <laughs> I like this Bible translation, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul gives Timothy a clear vision about what he's supposed to do. What about you in your life? Do you have a clear vision? Do you have a clear hot zone, a clear sense of what God wants you to do? I've shared the statistic through the years here as the pastor that less than one out of 10 pastors can articulate their church's vision. It's kind of a scary thing to consider when you think about the importance of vision in the Bible. That, that number comes from the researcher by the name of jo, uh, George Barna, and he wrote the book, The Power of Vision. The book has gone through several different editions. But in the book, he makes this comment, and I'll just read it to you. He says, although they are good people and have been called to ministry... Most senior pastors do not have an understanding of God's vision for the ministries they're trying to lead. And consequently, most churches have little impact in their community or in the lives of their congregants. Not even one out of every 10 pastors of Protestant churches can articulate God's vision for the church. Clearly, this is one of the most important areas for growth during the present decade, and he wrote that in the last decade. Now, if it's true that pastors don't have visions for their churches, it's also probably true that people who are in their churches don't have visions for their lives. In fact, Barna goes on to say this, most believers know about the concept of vision, but few have God's vision in their life and ministry. What about you today? Do you have a sense of what God's vision is in your life? Do you have a sense of Hazon? See, your life lived without vision is like living with, without visibility, driving without visibility. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you are, are doing. Barna defines vision. This is his definition. He just calls it simply a clear mental image. And if, if I were to kind of give you an example of it, it would be a a young pastor years ago started this church up in the Chicago area, grew it to become one of the most influential churches in the world, and famously gave the vision for his church along these lines, and it's impacted thousands and thousands of pastors and ministries. He says that the local church is the hope of the world. There are 7.8 billion people today on this earth, people living without hope. Churches need vision in a world like that. Churches need vision that knows that we're gonna have an impact to the very ends of the world because there are millions and millions of people right now living without hope. There's, a, there's an incredible importance to it. But there's not just an importance to it, right? This morning we may say, all right, it's important, pastor. So like, what is it? What does it look like for me? 
And so here we need to mention something about how we identify it or what it is. And so let me just tell you that in our church, you know, I've been the pastor here for seven and a half years. Seven and a half years ago, I, I, I came to, uh, uh, in June of that year, and my first Sunday at church, I went to all the different committees, we call them teams, and I told them, I said, one of the most important things our church needs to have is a very clear sense of vision. And so in those days, we created, this is our vision statement, we are many generations, one vision, a regional church with a missional mindset that seeks to welcome, include, reach, and equip people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, everything is great about that except for one thing. You just can't remember it. <laughs> so what we did is we simplified it into three things, and you saw them as you walked in from outside. They're out there on the wall. They're, they're on a lot of the things that we, that we print. And let me just go over them with you real quickly. First of all, a big part of what our vision here at First Baptist is is to help people find God. There are, like I said, billions of people in the world today. Many of them don't know Jesus. It's our job as Christians to help people find God. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples in John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And when he gave them the great commission in Matthew chapter 28, standing there right before he ascended into heaven, he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. I mean, that's a pretty big, bold statement, isn't it? We're, we are in the helping people find and discover God in their life. Now listen, if our church isn't about that, if our vision doesn't focus on that, if we say to ourselves like some churches do, you know, we don't really care if people come to know Jesus or come to this church. You know, you kind of like, there's some churches you walk up, nobody ever greets you. Nobody ever finds you a seat. In fact, there's some churches you walk into, somebody will come up to you and say, uh, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> you're sitting in my seat. It's like, hey, the ground is a good place for you, you know. It's like, not very welcoming, you know. The scriptures show us the importance of this, but you know, if you just think about it, practically speaking, like many, many churches that, are, that don't care about this are essentially saying what one of my mentors and former pastor at Green Acres Church in Tyler, David Dykes, has said many times to me, every church that does not care about reaching people ought to call every Sunday go to hell Sunday. Because in a sense, if we are not focused on helping people find God, we are saying to people, we don't care where you're spending eternity. I think every church should have at its heart the focus on helping people to do that. But not just that, but a second thing you'll always see in our, in our hallway out there, it says to be changed. When I, I first uh, started in ministry, I was not a pastor. I, I never even thought I'd be a pastor. It wasn't even in, the, in my mind that God had just called me to ministry, and my, my, my brother and some of his friends had a band, and they would go around to churches, and they would lead worship in all these little churches in East Texas, and they needed somebody to preach, and I wanted to go and preach. And so in all these little churches, all these little places, little towns like Pineland in East Texas, I remember we had a little revival, a youth revival, and about 40, 50 kids came, students from the high school. I remember one, one day a big old burly fo football player on the team, he walked down the aisle and he, with tears in his eyes, he accepted Christ as his savior. And I can just tell you story after story of just being able to do that and just seeing God move. I remember one church where, where one night, after several days of preaching and, and having this little youth revival that a young lady walked down and accepted Christ, and they told me afterwards, they said, well, actually, she was the only one there that had never done that. And it's, it's amazing to see God at work. I know and believe that God is still at work in this world. But one of the things I'd often say to myself is, I wonder whatever happened to those kids, Right? Like they came to know Jesus, but I, I wonder, is there anybody discipling them? Is there anybody teaching them about the Bible and helping them not just to, to know there is a God, but actually to be changed into becoming actual followers of Christ? Not just people who show up to church on Sunday morning and go, okay, I got my Bible, I'm ready for a little bit of God today, but people who are like, you know what? I want to give all my life to following Christ. I want to give God 100% of who I am. I'm all in for Jesus. Because I think that's what it means to really be a Christian. I think it's when we say, God, you have every part of my life. 
as we start this 2020, I just want to ask you, does God have every single part of your life? Does God, does God own every part of your life? Have you given yourself completely to him so that you can be changed, like Romans says, to be transformed in the renewing of your mind so that you can know his will? But not just that. You know, we could say that we're gonna do that. We could, we could come to know God. We could be changed. But then the 7.8 billion people on earth wouldn't even know him. So there has to be another one on there. And that third one is, of course, to make a difference. You know, as, as uh, Jesus started his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, he gave the Beatitudes. Not the bad attitudes, by the way. It's the Beatitude. And in the Beatitudes, right after that, he then makes this statement. He says, you are the light of the world. And then he makes this statement. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. Folks, if you're a Christian and you're here today, and you walk out of here, you may be the only person that somebody who doesn't know Jesus is gonna meet. And the question is, are you gonna be salt for them? Are you going to be a light for them? Are you going to be a guide for them to find God? You may be the only person that they encounter. You are the salt. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time eating food that doesn't have salt in it. You can tell instantly. You could take this, do this, and it tastes good, right? A Christian, quote unquote, that has no salt is a Christian who is making no difference in this world. We must raise the bar of the expectation for our lives that say, God has called all of us as Christians to be difference makers. God has called all of us as Christians to be salt and light. Because listen to what Jesus says. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. If everyone here comes to church on Sunday morning and then we go through the rest of our lives saltless, making no difference, what good are we? except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So let's be a people as we start this 2020 who, who commit ourselves to helping people find God, who commit ourselves to helping people to be changed, to not just being like Christians, but like being Christians, and then also committing ourselves to being difference makers who are really salt and light. Now you may say, all right, preacher, that's a pretty good sermon so far. And all of this might be pretty good, and all of this could be something we think about and we talk about and then walk out of here and make absolutely no difference in our life. In other words, when it comes to hasson, when it comes to vision, it's not just something that we receive. It's not just something that the prophet gives us. It is also something that must be internalized or put another way, it must be applied in our life. And so let's finish by talking about the application of it. The application of it in our lives that we actually will have God's vision in our life. I've defined vision through the years like this. Number one, it's seeing what is there. Um, late last year, I had an eye surgery done. I had a LASIK eye surgery. And I don't know if you know it or not, but I had, like, had historically the worst vision of almost anybody I knew. And so at night, you know, I'd see one of my kids running through the house or something, and I was like, it's a burglar, you know, because I couldn't see. <laughs> so... You know, I just, I just couldn't see. And so uh, now, because I had that surgery at night, I can, like, I can see, okay, it's just one of my kids. I'm gonna go back to sleep or whatever. It's, it's nice to be able to see. Seeing what is there is the basic definition of vision, isn't it? I mean, that's how we define it. As we look at ourselves in this church, as we look at this community, and as we look around, what do we see happening in this community? What do we see happening in Ellis County right now? I'd say that one of the big things is growth. This was the, put out by our, our city. Uh, it was put in the newspaper. And it talks about the population. This is just Waxahachie, but how fast it's growing more than ever before and, and how it continues to grow. Like When I see stuff like that as the pastor of First Baptist Church, I say to myself, we have a vision here in this community to help people 
find God, be changed, and make a difference. We, we need to enlarge our vision. So I want to challenge you and encourage you to pray for our Vision 2020 task force as they give vision to the future of our church so that we can help reach people. So that's part of what's seeing what is there. But the second thing I've said through the years about what vision is, is that vision is also seeing what God wants done. Seeing what God wants, what is his hatzon in your life today? What does God want to do in you this morning? What does God want to do in you in 2020? What does God want done? And then finally, seeing that it gets done. I mean, what good is it to have a vision if nobody ever puts it into practice? Where there is no vision, where there is no chasson, the people perish, the people pra. They have no, they run amok, they run wild. But where there is vision, where there is an understanding of what God wants us to do, our life has direction. So let me just ask you this morning, at the beginning of this 2020, what about you? Does your life right now have clarity? Do you have a sense of what God wants you to do? And if not, Maybe right where we are as we finish this sermon, you would want us to say to God, you know, God, I need to get that clarity about my life. Now, for some of you, it might be that that clarity has been blurred by just some blatant sin that just stands out right now in your life. And, and because you are just absolutely, you're absolutely attached to that sin, you're bound to that sin. As we begin 2020, what you need to do is you need to allow God to just break free whatever that is in your life, and begin to bring spiritual renewal and revival in you so that you can have vision for what he wants you to do. I'm gonna pray for that as we finish this sermon. Father, I just pray this morning for all of us here, those who might be watching us this morning or at some other time as they hear this message, that don't have just clarity about what it is you want them to do in their life. I pray, Father, that right now, you would begin to give that vision. I pray, Father, that even as I'm preaching this sermon, that you are delivering your vision, that you are breathing your words into their heart, into their life. And maybe there's someone here today who's who's hearing this message and they're saying, you know, today I need to, I need to be born again. I need to give my heart to Jesus. I need to give my life to Christ. I've never done that before. Or Lord, maybe there's somebody here today who's been a Christian for a long, 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 long time, but their life has no salt. It has no substance. They're not difference makers because they're just too, too wrapped up in themselves or they're too bound to their sins. They're just holding them back. And God, this morning could be a morning of breakthrough in their lives as they enter this year. I pray for that, God. I pray for things that are holding them back to to be removed. And I pray, God, that they would begin to see and to hear and to follow you in this new year. And Father, I pray that the vision that you would give to each of us individually would bring revival to our lives, would bring revival to our church, would bring revival to our community. God, that would bring revival to our nation, that would bring revival to the ends of the earth, to a fresh and new obedience of the people of God to following you, and more people who don't even know you yet to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would just to stand, this is the time of our service that we call our invitation, and at the end of the service, I just kind of stand down here at the front, and God's been speaking to your heart today. You need to make some decision and just kind of just share that. Whether to become a part of the life of the church or to be baptized or just have somebody to pray with you. Or maybe you just want to come down here and pray for your own spiritual life, for God to reinvigorate or revitalize for you in this 2020 or for somebody else. Pray that and encourage you to, to have the courage just to kind of step out of wherever you are and come forward and do that as we sing.